Finding love is a bit of an adventure, especially finding radical love of yourself. Today's guest has an incredibly unique story of finding all sorts of love through the outdoors and by pushing herself out of her comfort zone. Sarah Heron is a creative, a filmmaker, a nonprofit founder, and an entrepreneur. Born and raised in Denver, Colorado, a place known for its access to lots of outdoor activities, Sarah didn't love spending time outside as a kid. She was born without the bottom half of her left arm. It's a condition known as a congenital limb difference, and it affects about 2,000 babies born in the U.S. every year. Because of this physical difference, Sarah often felt timid and embarrassed. She didn't love how her arm looked in a ski jacket or having to ski with one pole, and she just wasn't as confident as she is today. In her 20s, things started to change, and when she decided to say yes to being on a national TV show, things changed even more. I'm Shelby Stanger, and this is Wild Ideas Worth Living. As a kid, Sarah didn't love doing sports. She didn't want teammates looking at her or treating her differently because of her limb difference. In her 20s, though, she was living in L.A. and she was working at a place called 72 and Sunny, which is a top marketing firm. While there, a friend nominated her to try out for the reality show The Bachelor. But before we get into if she got the final rose or not, I wanted to ask Sarah a little bit more about her childhood and her relationship to the outdoors. I thought we'd just start with your background. I thought it was really interesting. You're, you're such an outdoors woman now, but you said you grew up hating sports. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about just your background and why you really didn't like sports. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's, that's a good question because I do feel like it gets kind of glossed over a lot, but when I was a kid, I just, I hated, hated doing anything that required physical effort. And I think a lot of that came from feeling awkward in my body and only having one arm, um, just feeling a little bit insecure about my ability and capability and um, not wanting to draw attention to myself for, you know, in an arena where I already felt like I was looked at for being different. And so Mm. as a kid, I just, I didn't gravitate towards the sports or the teams that you know, most of my peers were doing because I just wanted to stay inside or play with dolls and be creative and use my imagination, which is also really cool and awesome. But I just didn't, I didn't really want to be looked at. And so I I really didn't take to sports or anything that challenged my physical ability. I mean, being a kid is, is awkward enough growing up. So I can understand that. But then as an adult, you moved to LA which is such an interesting choice of places to move. I I mean, I love that you're an artist. You get this job. Tell me a little bit about this job you get. You got a job at literally the top, I think one of the top advertising agencies in the country, 72 and sunny. Well, I actually moved out for school because like I said, I was super creative and always gravitated towards arts and graphic design. And um, I moved out for design school and I landed this internship at 72 and Sunny, which was a startup ad agency that had about 50 employees at the time. And they were doing work for mostly just digital work for brands like Carl's Jr. and Call of Duty. So I took the opportunity and it turned out to be the greatest stepping stone of my career because 72 turned out to be or grow into this major, I mean, just like powerhouse So The Bachelor is a pretty big TV show. Take us to that moment where you were in LA, you were single, and you didn't really love dating, but somehow you decided to do The Bachelor. How does that happen? (laughs) Okay, well, the thing is, I actually loved boys, but I didn't like dating. I wanted to. I was just really struggling to put myself out there. So let's see, I was 20, I was about 24 years old. And, you know, at this point, probably five or six years into that job at 72 and Sunny. And that was like my focus. And I put everything all of my energy and all my efforts into that job and quite frankly, distracted myself with the job from developing my personal life and developing social skills and dating skills. And I was just so insecure as a 23 year old living in LA surrounded by like beautiful women and beautiful men. And it was like, every time you'd go to the bar, 
you know, everyone's just getting phone numbers of hot people and hooking up and I wasn't. So I was tired of being single and I had explored doing some like of the dating apps. I don't think Tinder, any of that was around back then, but match.com. And I just remember being at this particular part of my life where I didn't feel comfortable putting photos of myself on my profile because I was worried that if people saw my photo that I only had one arm, they would just immediately reject me and that I wouldn't even have a shot. Or two, if I didn't put photos of my arm or like a full body image on my dating profile that then the guy would show up for the date and feel tricked and then walk out on me. So I just was like, I don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to put myself out there. And I guess the moral of the story is a friend knew I was obsessed with watching the TV show, The Bachelor. And she went in for casting and she was like, I have to be honest. I don't think this is really for me. However, I work with this girl who would be an amazing contestant. (laughs) And so she (laughs) gave them my name and she came back to work and she was like, Sarah, I told the casting producers about you. You're going to be getting a call from them. And I was just kind of like, oh, my God, are you are you serious? Like, it was totally surreal. And it was weird because it was like, this is my dream. I've grown up watching the show. I've fantasized about it. This is incredible. But at the same time, oh, my God, I can't even put a photo of myself on the Internet. How am I going to go on a national TV show? So that was kind of how it all came about. That's so interesting. I mean, first of all, you have model like looks. So it's it. But L.A. is a really I mean, I remember being single and I would say that's like the one of the hardest towns to be single in. Yeah, it's brutal. But that's great. So you so you do The Bachelor and you're the first contestant they've ever had with a physical difference on the show. Yes. So first of all, how did you get the courage to just say yes when they said, hey, we want you on the show? Well, I went into casting and you have to know, like, I I truly did believe in the format of the show because this was before, like I said, Instagram yeah, literally had come out like that year. I mean, I had like 15 followers on Instagram, you know, and so there wasn't this hidden agenda to like go on The Bachelor and become an influencer. Like no one was doing that. It was just you go on the show for the experience and hopefully to meet someone and you know, I am a hopeless romantic and I did grow up watching the show. And so I, I believed in it. I I believed if I go on the show, I could have my chance at meeting someone. And at the very least I will have come out of my shell. Right. And I will have faced my fears and then I don't have to hide anymore. I don't have to hide my photos online. I don't have to hide my arm when I go out to the bars because By that point, I will have already been on a national TV show. Like there's nothing to hide anymore. And so that was literally my mindset was this is either going to work for me by finding my husband on TV, which sounds so crazy now, or it's going to help me just break free from this fear that I've been living in my whole life. That takes a lot of courage. What was it like? I mean, I understand because I watched some clips of you. You had to do some crazy things like beyond wearing a bathing suit on TV, which (laughs) is nerve wracking for anybody. Mm -hmm. You had to do things like jump out of giant buildings, like do obstacle courses that would require or be a lot easier with two hands than one. Yeah, Mm -hmm. And it it almost felt like, well, you can say it, but I mean, (laughs) it almost felt like they kind of cast you as as the girl with a physical difference and we're going to test her a little differently. Yeah, you're right. So it's funny because going into it, my my biggest fear was being in my swimsuit on TV. Like I never was like, oh, they're going to, you know, put me in compromising situations with only having one arm or I never anticipated that. I was like, I don't want to be in my swimsuit on national television. And that was kind of what I fixated on going into it. But then once I got there, I did quickly discover that they kept putting me on these dates that seem to challenge my ability. And I like to think that, you know, because of my experience in production and advertising, like they didn't have one over on me. I knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> like, this is funny that I keep getting put on the date where they're asking me to saw logs. Like, are you kidding? No, I know exactly what they're doing. And I kind of 
leaned into it, but was kind of frustrated about it, obviously, because after a certain point, it just felt like, man, they really just want to see me struggle and they really want to see me crack under under these pressures. But I saw it also as an opportunity to show them that I wasn't afraid. For example, my very first date was I got the very first date of the season and they took us to this skyscraper downtown L.A. My bachelor was Sean. Sorry, I don't know if I mentioned that. What's Sean's last name? Sean Lowe. Okay. And he so I got the very first date and they took us to the skyscraper downtown L.A. And they were like, "Okay, you're going to jump off the top of this skyscraper. And I think they were expecting me to be like so afraid because that's that's the tension, right? They want the contestants to be afraid so that then the bachelor has to like console them through the high tension and, you know, get them down safely. And I was just like, I'm not afraid. Like, this is awesome because, you know, I was like beginning to like adventure more. We haven't really discussed that yet. But at this point in life, I was I was coming around to thrill and adventure. And so when they put us on the top of the skyscraper, I was like, this is awesome. And I totally didn't need anyone to like hold my hand down. Regardless, yeah, I was always, yeah. The most hardcore of adventures would be terrified jumping off of a, how many story building was it? It was like 300 feet. Yeah, that's no joke. I mean, that's no, that's, it wasn't. That's so scary. So when you do it, you jump, you obviously survived. How did it change you? I mean, I guess like my thing is like, I knew nothing was going to happen. They're not going to let me get injured or die. You know, it's a TV show. So it's like, I felt very safe. Mm. But what was cool is that it, it allowed this expressive side of me to come out that was like, I love adventure and I love doing these things. Or maybe it was like that I loved proving to the producers that I wasn't afraid. And it's like proving to them, oh, you think I have one arm and I'm going to be afraid to do this. Well, watch me. And I really liked that feeling of just like showing people, no, like you might have this idea or this perception of me and it's wrong. I actually really like doing things that push me out of my comfort zone. So I think it was cool. And it just kind of awoke that challenger force inside of me. So I'm a little bit of a hopeless romantic too. And I feel like if I jumped off a building with a guy that I just met and had some sort of attraction to, I'd like fall in love with him after we jumped. (laughs) Yeah, you do. But I felt like I was still so afraid Like I was so afraid to just be myself still under those circumstances because everything is so heightened, right? And Mm -hmm. it's now it's been your first date and now you've jumped off a building and you're laying on this like amazing chase lounge and you're supposed to kiss and you're supposed to share your deepest, darkest fears. And within 24 hours, you're supposed to be falling in love. And maybe, but I don't know. I just, I was so afraid still. And I felt like, I was, I was just very guarded, but at the same time, I wanted it really badly. And I think part of being on that show is you convince yourself that you are in love with the lead. You are in love with the bachelor because everything is so magical and everything is so curated. And it's a, it is that hopeless romantic fairy tale that you've always, you know, grown up reading about in Disney books or seeing on Disney movies and it feels real. And so you convince yourself into thinking this is real. It's only been 24 hours. We're totally falling in love. But the reality is I wasn't, I don't think I was really there. I was really guarded. So you're a big proponent of supporting other women, but on The Bachelor, you're competing with other women. How did you handle that? Um, Well, it's really interesting because you actually form better relationships within the house. Because if you think about it, like you're only seeing the lead when he comes into the house, when you're at cocktail parties, when it's shared time with other women, but you're living in the house with the other women. And it really creates this very strange, very unnatural dance of where like you're supposed to be competing against these other women. You're supposed to feel I don't know, but then they become your best friends. And so you're like, this is weird. You're my best friend. And I'm helping you get dressed to go on your date with the guy that I'm also seeing today. And it just creates these really weird relationships. And so you kind of have to create these like blockers in your head of like, well, I want what's best for my friend and I want what's best for me. And, you know, we all just have to go through this 
the best that we can right now. And what's meant to be will be like, it's, it can't be like a fight, you know, it's not an actual competition in my eyes. It was always like, well, if my friend ends up being better for Sean than I am, or if he's better for her than he is for me, then more power to them. You know, um, it's weird. I didn't get competitive in that sense. Wow. You're like a very strong woman. (laughs) I mean, it might've been different if I had serious feelings for Sean, but to reiterate, I don't think I actually did. I think I thought I did. So, so you got pretty far on the show, even though, you know, you weren't totally in love with him, but you didn't, you didn't obviously get the final rose, but after the show, you had to have been changed. How did the show change you? Immediately, the show didn't change me that much, right? Because you come back and you go back to your normal life for like six months while the show is being edited. And then it airs. And that's when everything changes. And for me, it was like this tsunami of just outreach from people all across the country and the world, you know, little girls, moms, dads, aunts, sisters of women who were like me, who either had a limb difference or a physical disability or even just an emotional disability, reaching out and saying that they felt for the first time I was someone that they could relate to on the show. And a lot of that was because on the show, I did express a lot of vulnerability and and just the, those feelings of like not being worthy and not feeling deserving of being on the show Um, which a lot of women up until that point never expressed. Like everyone was very confident and very sure of themselves of being on that show. And I was like the first girl that was like, I don't think I belong here. And this is kind of different for me. And so women related to that. And it, when I started getting this influx of messages and fan mail and, you know, literally handwritten letters that were sent to my boss and redirected to me at work because they were just trying to find me, it, really made me realize like, holy cow, there's so many women out there like me who also are experiencing these feelings of insecurity and, and just like self doubt when it comes to their worthiness and their value. And so I just wanted to like do something about that, but I didn't really know how for a long time. Yeah. People fell in love with you. I mean, you're a really likable human. At one point you told me, you felt like you had some more work to do on yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned that I had this influx of people wanting advice and I didn't know, I didn't know how to be that role model for them. I, I felt like I was still, there was so much work to be done on myself and I was still needing to grow so much into my self-acceptance and my self-love that I couldn't possibly be that person or that role model for other people. And so even though I was getting this huge fan base, I ignored it for a long time because I just didn't know how to own that responsibility. And I felt that I needed to continue working on myself, which is what took me outside and took me, you know, hiking and skiing. So yeah, it was definitely a couple of years before I knew exactly how to like mobilize, I guess you could say this, this audience that I was getting. This show is about adventure and it sounds like between The Bachelor and Bachelor in Paradise and then what you did afterwards, you have the most incredible story about finding love. Yeah, <laughs> I do. And, and it's interesting because I, I've, I've been on all these dating shows now and it's like, I never found love on the dating shows, but I found love with myself and it just took a really long time to get there. But I really feel that each time I went on the show, it helped me get closer and closer to the real self-love that I needed to find. You know, it it was never about finding a husband or Prince Charming. It was, it was about finding love. So let's talk about that. Self-love is a big thing and it's hard. It's hard today, especially with Instagram. And other people showing us what self-love should look like. And it's a a filtered self-love. So what are some of the ways that you think you've been able to find self-love? One of the biggest ones for me has been community. And I think being able to surround yourself with like-minded people who allow you to be your true authentic self who love you and appreciate you for whoever you are, however you show up, helps you believe that you are deserving of that love. And so for me, 
as I said, I, I started to find a really strong community through hiking and being outside because that was where I felt I could be my true authentic self. You know, I wasn't trying to wear fancy clothes. I wasn't trying to like have my hair perfect or do put on a ton of makeup. It was like, you just get to show up as you are. And then people in that particular community, you know, in recreation, I feel like they just want to see you succeed. And everybody just loves each other for who they are. And there's so much encouragement and support that once people started seeing me for who I was and encouraging me and supporting me, it allowed me to see, yeah, I am a badass or yeah, I am awesome or I am lovable. And so for me, I think community is a huge component of self-love because it allows you to, to just be who you truly authentically are. While Sarah didn't find love on the show, she found so many other things. Confidence, a willingness to push herself outside of her comfort zone, and a passion for adventure. After the show, people started contacting her. They loved that she shared her story and was sharing more of her whole self on social media. There was a ton of people who also had a similar story and related. It took some time, but eventually, Sarah decided to connect with her new fans in a more meaningful way. Find out how after the break. As more women are getting out there doing badass things in the outdoors, it's important to find gear that's actually made for women. That's why I was excited when Keen from Portland, Oregon came out with its women's Terradora athletic hiking shoes. Every detail is designed specifically for a woman's foot, taking into consideration things like a more contoured arch, a narrower heel, cushioning in different areas, and more support in others. I love that King gets that. I also appreciate their consciously constructed approach to making shoes using more sustainable materials, all the way down to eco anti-odor, which naturally breaks down foot funk without pesticides and water repellency that's PFC free. We can feel great treading lighter on the planet while we're out exploring it. For an all-around hiking shoe, check out the woman-specific fit of the Keen Terradora, available at REI. After her adventure on The Bachelor, Sarah found a passion for adventuring outside, and she even took up sports like rappelling and rock climbing. Pursuing these activities wasn't easy, but they proved to be rewarding. So you, you went back to your normal job, but you told me after that, you got even more into the outdoors. Yes. So right around that same time, exactly, I started hiking. And I think it was because I like dated a guy that was like, took me on this epic hike. And it was just like, wow, I really like this. I really like being outside. And so I started doing it more and more often. Every weekend, I would find a new hike to go on and a lot of times by myself. Um, but I quickly started making friends through that community. Like I would meet people on the trail and then we would link up the next weekend to go on a hike. And I just got really, really hooked. And before I knew it, it was like I wanted bigger adventures, longer adventures, more extreme adventures. And I was sharing all of it to Instagram and I was sharing, you know, my photos from the summit and I'd be sharing like me along the trail. And it was just, it felt really true and authentic and just these like snapshots of my life and how I was feeling empowerment and confident in those moments. And people loved it. And I started getting all these messages that were like, I've never been hiking. I would love to go hiking with you. <laughs> or I would love to, do you have any hikes you recommend? What kind of hiking boots do you wear? This is so amazing. And it really created this great dialogue between me and people I didn't know. And most of those people were also girls with differences like me. So it, yeah, it created a really fun way to engage that felt really authentic and inspired through nature and getting outside. And now you get outside a lot. Yeah. You started hiking and then along your journey to, to, to kind of pushing yourself more and more in the outdoors, you find rock climbing. What was that first experience rock climbing like? Okay. So rock climbing, yeah, is newer for me uh, still. So 
I, I would say, though, it started with repelling. My boyfriend, spoiler, I did find love, but not on the show. And my boyfriend is like a pro at everything outside. And so when we started dating, he was like, oh, you want to be this like adventure advocate? Sweet. Let's see what you're really made of. <laughs> and took me to Utah and was like, let's take you repelling. And he took me rappelling down in Moab and I just loved it. I mean, I was terrified at first, but I was like, oh, I really love this feeling of being self-supported on a rope, like dangling 90 feet into a canyon and yeah, just getting that adrenaline rush. And so we started rappelling more and more and that obviously just escalated into climbing. And then eventually Dylan was like, well, let's take you climbing. So we started in a gym and it was tough. It was really hard. And, uh, you know, I, I get frustrated really easily. That's just my personality type. And I think if I don't cry when I'm trying a new sport, something's not right. Cause, <laughs> um, because I typically always cry and yeah, so we went climbing in a gym and I liked it and, you know, I was totally gassed, but I freaking loved it and I wanted to do it again. And we live in Western Colorado. So we started going outside and I would just do, you know, some little slabs and get comfortable on the rock and I'm slowly working my way up. Okay. I can't see this. So, so climbing with one arm, how do you, yeah. how do you do it? It is tough. So, so my arm is like, I lost my arm right at my elbow, but I have an elbow joint. So I have a little bit of mobility. Like imagine bending your elbow I have just a tiny little bit of a grip on my elbow, which allows me to, you know, get a little bit of a hold on, uh, or I guess like I can kind of, yeah, just kind of grab on or get a little bit of a hold on a rock. So it's tough if like that, I think that's been my biggest learning curve is those holds have to be like the right size for my arm because I obviously don't, it's not as small as fingertips, mm -hmm. you know, cramping on. So it's really tough with just my elbow, but I'm learning how to, you know, climb more with my legs and use the strength of my legs and really only use my hands, my hand and my arm for balance and navigating my way around the rock. But it's definitely a long learning curve. Yeah. I've, I've taught a lot of adaptive surfing and it's a whole other ball game. I mean, you have to be really creative and really smart and have a lot of confidence. Yeah. It's tough. And I think you just have to get inventive because there are a lot of adaptive climbers and I'm meeting more and more, but like we could talk about Maureen Beck, for example, who's a champion paraclimber, but Maureen and I don't, our arms are different, right? Like she's lost her arm at a different place than mine. And so she can only give me so much beta on how to climb with one arm because we're going to experience it differently. And so you really just have to try things out for yourself. And I'm learning slowly, but, you know, you learn different techniques as you go. A few years ago, Sarah decided she could really help a lot more people beyond connecting with them through email and sharing her story on social media. In 2016, she started SheLift. It's a nonprofit organization that aims to share Sarah's love of the outdoors and the transformative powers of adventure with other women and girls who have physical differences. She Live helps people gain confidence and lifts women up through outdoor adventure and body positive mentorship. It's an amazing organization. So you've started this movement and you started a nonprofit called She Lift. Tell me about She Lift because I'm just going to tell you a story really quickly. Sorry, I know this is your podcast interview, but I have a girlfriend <laughs> who had a child really recently was born without her lower left arm. And she said, you know, there's one girl that's just gotten me through this and, and taught me that my daughter's going to be a freaking rock star and that I shouldn't be scared. And that's Sarah Heron. And mm. she tears up when she tells me, I'm like, I'm going to tear up telling you about this. I'm having lunch with her tomorrow, but you've been her biggest Aww. source of inspiration. And she has this little daughter that's totally doing everything she should be able to do. But but there was a, a moment where her mom was really scared. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, first of all, tell her thank you. And hopefully you're able to connect us. I 
it is, I think, very scary for moms um, as I'm learning through the organization and we, we do serve moms as well, moms of kiddos with limb differences and physical differences. And so I do hear their stories and their perspectives. And of course, I know my moms and I think, you know, a lot of moms carry anxiety of like, did they do something wrong or what's my, how is my daughter going to survive and get through things? And the biggest thing that I can just tell everyone is they're going to find a way. Like there's always going to be ways to help these kids be rock stars. So, so you started SheLift when, and, and what's the mission? I started SheLift in 2016 and I was still working full time at 72 and Sunny. And I had this idea because skiing is above all my favorite sport. I love skiing. And, you know, I did draw some inspiration from Bethany Hamilton because I had attended her surf camp and I was like, it's awesome that Bethany brings all of these amputees together and teaches them to surf. And I was skiing with my dad in Aspen one year and I saw this man who is in a sit ski, like ripping down these moguls. And then he fell and he was by himself and he just like propped himself back up and took off back down the moguls. And I was like, I was like, that guy is so badass. Like that was the most incredible thing. And I just had this like light bulb go off. I was like, I love skiing. Skiing has been so transformative for me. I want to bring together a group of girls with limb differences and teach them how to ski. So you wanted to start She Lift with skiing. Yes. So I wanted to be able to give girls that same feeling of looking up at a mountain and saying, that was my mountain and I just conquered it. And it's funny because that kind of became the whole organization's tagline and everything. But yeah, so initially Wait, I what's just- What's that tagline? Every girl has a mountain to conquer. Mm, love it. So I just started it as like, hey, this is going to be a side project, like a passion thing of mine. I'm going to take a group of girls skiing and it's going to be awesome. So I'm not sure like why <laughs> I felt like it needed to be a nonprofit right away, but I was like, yeah, let's make it a nonprofit. And I went through all of, you know, the formalities of starting the nonprofit and then raised a bunch of money, raised like $35,000 within a couple weeks. Wow. Yeah. Mainly through Instagram. And then I put together an application and I said, you know, said, Hey girls, I'm taking six of you skiing in Colorado submit your application on shelift.org. And we had like 200 applicants and uh, narrowed it down to a final seven that we actually took. And I rented out a house and took a bunch of girls skiing. And we partnered with Challenge Aspen, which is an organization in Aspen that helps adaptive sports. So in the winter they do skiing and we took girls skiing and it was pretty amazing. And, and then the organization just continued to grow and expand from there. I imagine you've watched so many people go through a transformation by taking them skiing. Yeah. And, and that was kind of like definitely the fixing point of she lift is I didn't want to just take girls skiing on a mountain for one day. Like I, yes, we could have taken all 200 people skiing, but I wanted it to be really intimate. I wanted it to feel very special and curated for these girls so that they could build lifelong lasting friendships and mentorships. So, you know, I I did bring in mentors. I brought in Jen Hudak, who's a a retired pro skier. She's also on my board of SheLift. And, you know, she helped mentor the girls and we worked with amazing partners. And as I said, I just wanted these girls to have that really a transformative experience where whether or not they decide they want to be skiers, at least they had some sort of experience that showed them they're not alone. They can conquer any obstacle. And a lot of it is done through community and mentorship. What do you tell people who come to your retreats for advice on fitting in when you have a physical difference? I think one of the biggest discussion points that we encounter and have often is there's a lot of there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of feelings of unjust and feelings of why me why am I this way I hate it when people call me inspirational or I hate it when people <laughs> tell me I'm a badass like 
Um, Sorry, because I feel like I just called you a badass, but you mean no, you're a badass. I know, <laughs> but I'm glad you did because I wanted to talk about it because I think a lot of these women, they just want to feel normal, right? They don't want to be seen as extraordinary. They don't want to be seen as different. Mm, that makes sense. So when they come in feeling this way, it's like, it's so important that we redirect that conversation into feeling like you are a badass and here's why it's not because anyone pities you and thinks it's amazing that you're rock climbing or skiing. It's just amazing that anyone is rock climbing and it makes it extra amazing because you're killing it with, you know, the challenges that you've encountered. And so I think the biggest piece of advice is like, is just trying to help these girls realize that they are amazing and, and what they're doing is incredible. And that's because they're incredible, resilient human beings, not because they have a disability. So what advice can you give to me? I have this interesting thing that happened. I've, I've, I've had vitiligo and mm -hmm. developed pretty recently after I got back from New Zealand, my, my lips were starting to turn white and I was like, oh, I'm just sunburned. And then the doctor's like, no, you have vitiligo. And I was like, oh, that sucks. Thought I could just put some cream on it and it would go away. And I've done like every diet in the book and just fasted on water. And sometimes it goes away. Sometimes it doesn't. The only thing that correlates with it is stress. And it's an interesting physical difference because it comes and it goes and then it gets worse and then it'll like be healed and then it'll get worse. But it's weird. Like I, I find myself wanting to go up to other people with vitiligo being like, oh my God, I, I totally relate. But like if someone went up to me, mm. it'd kind of drive me nuts. Hey, okay. So, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And I, I actually know a few women who've come through some workshops of mine who have vitiligo and we've, I've, we've talked about it a lot. And I have two two things to say. So just this last week here in my small town of Carbondale, if anyone listens to this, knows where Carbondale is. It's like Western Colorado. It's supposed to be like one of the best places to live if you're an adventure athlete. It's pretty epic. And but it's very small. We have 4000 people in my town and we were at a county fair this weekend and I was ordering a sandwich from one of the food booths and the girl working the register was this like 16 year old girl who had one arm exactly like me. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like so loud. I was like, Oh my gosh, you have one arm. Oh, Oh my gosh. I was like, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to like embarrass you. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't embarrass you. I just got so excited because we're in such a small town and I yeah. never see anyone like that. And I, you know, I, I immediately felt shame and I felt so bad for calling her out because I remember as a teenager and a young adult, I remember also people coming up and being like, hey, you have one arm, so do I. And all I wanted to do was murder that person. Yes. Like I was like, oh my God, thank you for just calling me out for the number one thing that I am most insecure about. Like, thank you so much. You make me feel horrible. It was the worst feeling. And so when I, when I knew I did this to that girl, I was like, crap, oh my God, I feel so bad because I'm in a different place than she is right now. Mm. And so I just went back up to her, her subtly and I was like, I'm really sorry if I embarrassed you, but here's my name and my number. I'd love to chat with you sometime. I love to paddleboard. If, if you're into paddleboarding, like let's go hang out. And she was like, okay, thanks. And I'll probably never hear from her because I, I get it. I probably mortified her. But so my advice to you is like, it, it takes work, right? Like you were just recently diagnosed with your vitiligo. And so it's, it's hard to see that difference as a uniqueness or a beauty right now. But I always try to tell our she lift girls, what makes you different is what makes you unique and beautiful. And I used to hide my arm when I would go out because I didn't want people to identify me or notice that I had one arm. And now I wear it like a badge. I'm like, the more people that can see me rock climbing with one arm or the more people that can see me paddleboarding with one arm, the better. Because I just want to show people that differences show up in all kinds of ways. And the more that we see those differences, the more we can see the beauty and um, and just like the universal similarities that we all have. So with vitiligo, I think it's like just um, – you know, if someone asks you if you got a facial or a peel or something, just I would just like confidently explain to them, no, I have this skin condition and it's new to me, but I'm rocking it and I'm figuring it out day by day. 
That's great advice. And I've been trying to use humor as much as I can. Yeah. But also honesty. And I think what's interesting about having an outer physical difference is most people struggle with an inner difference. You know, we all have insecurities. And if you kind of have one on the outside, it's like, well, you get to deal with it. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because my personal trainer says that also. Um, my personal trainer is also like my life coach and (laughs) she's like, Sarah, in many ways you're lucky because what makes you different and your challenges are outward facing many people, for many people it's on the inside and sometimes coming out and getting those off of our chest is so much harder than just seeing someone like, oh, she has one arm. Well, a lot of people are struggling with anxiety and, you know, emotional or learning disabilities or mental illnesses, and those aren't visible and they're harder to explain and they're harder to talk about. Yeah, that's really good advice. Thank you, listeners, for letting me hog Sarah for my personal use. But hopefully some people (laughs) listening, I imagine, got something out of that as well. There are some amazing models coming out more and more who have vitiligo, and I just think it's so so unique and so beautiful. And I I hope that you can see that too. Well, thank you. I'm working on it. Yeah. Besides that, you you went out and you're a storyteller and you decided to take storytelling to full another level by making a documentary, which is really cool. Dead last. That (laughs) like serendipitously REI licensed, which is so great. So let's talk about dead last and in in what it is because when we first talked you know you'd just done this film and i was like wow this is so cool yeah dead last is a project i've been working on for a little less than a year with dylan my boyfriend who's a director and it was kind of this birth child of we both love creating film and we love telling stories and simultaneously a girl who had come through she lift reached out to me and said, hey, if it wasn't for SheLift, I never would have come home and started rock climbing. And it turns out I loved rock climbing so much that I entered myself for the National Paraclimbing Championship. And I placed fourth place, which means I'm going to world championships in Innsbruck, Austria. And I was just blown away. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? All of this within nine months. She was so dedicated to learning to climb that she, I mean, she was taking herself to the gym three to five days a week, learning how to do it with one arm, watching her mentors and just absorbing as much as she could. And so she placed in worlds and I was just selfishly like, Caitlin, um, I have to come tell your story. This is amazing. I'm so proud of you. So we arranged to go to um, Innsbruck with her and followed her to worlds and created the the piece dead last which is you know her journey spoiler alert she came in dead last at the competition and the point and and the reason we named it that is because as Caitlin very well demonstrates in the film it's not about winning it was never about winning for her it was about coming to the competition finding a community and finally feeling like she belonged somewhere because her whole life she she never felt like she belonged So she placed dead last and it's a great little film about, you know, body confidence and what your body is capable of achieving in such a short amount of time. And I'm so excited to have it on REI's channels. Oh, it's great. It's only eight minutes long, but you're pumped when you watch it and you want to be friends with Caitlin and she's so funny. She's a really lovable character. It's on REI.com. You can find it on their video and podcast page and or you could just Google dead last. What's next? Are there going to be more films in your future? You're really good at this. Yeah, thanks. I'm definitely trying to move more into filmmaking and and just more storytelling, whether that revolves around SheLift or not. I, I would love you know to tell a SheLift story every year. I think that's kind of my goal. And yeah, some changes are coming structurally to the nonprofit and to the organization because we've grown so much. It it really just in the last year, I mean, we like hit that tipping point where we were kind of hovering around 40 people, 40 members in the organization, and now we're at 500. So just like in a year, it's really blown up. And so 
like I said, we're having some structural reorganization discussions about how we can serve a bigger community and, and be more intentional about it. Um, you know, I said earlier, my goal is, has always been to create these very intimate, intentional, intentional, yeah, <laughs> intentional experiences for women. And so as we're growing, I think it's, it's super important that I want to stay that way. I don't want it to expand so quickly that we lose that intimacy. Mm. And so, yeah, we're just going to figure out what the next step is. And in the meantime, hopefully just keep sharing amazing stories from these incredible ladies. And we're partnering with REI Adventures in May nice. and taking, yeah, we're taking She Lift to Machu Picchu. What? So yeah, that's going to be huge. And I'm so excited. We get to take anywhere between four and 16. So I guess however many, however many people sign up, we're going to Machu Picchu. That's fantastic. So we'll, yeah. we'll put a link to how to sign up in the show notes. Before we ended our chat, I wanted to ask Sarah how things were going on the love front. So I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering, you know, anybody who's single advice on finding love because your adventure has been, you know, on land, on skis, on rocks, you know, rappelling off mountains. But I think you've had the greatest adventure in finding love. Why don't you tell us how you met Dylan, who's a total hottie and seems like a great guy? Yeah, Dylan is great. He's amazing. I actually met him because I hired him to help with She Lift. And it was that very first ski retreat that I told you about. I was well, let me back up because of my background in advertising. I knew I wanted to make st like a storytelling content piece about the retreat. So I hired Dylan as a director who came as a referral from like a friend of a friend of a friend. <laughs> and I remember I was living in LA still kind of closing up my life there, selling my, getting rid of my apartment. And I had a director call with him and it was all just very professional at first, but I immediately was like, he sounds really hot. <laughs> like his voice <laughs> is really hot. And then we had a production meeting the following week and I was like, yeah, I'm not really into it. Like I thought I was, but he's super talented. That's awesome. He was kind of intimidating, to be honest. We went skiing together on that first production call or for first production meeting. We hiked Aspen Highland Bowl together. Because I was like, hey, I know you're a pro skier, but like, I just want you to know these girls that you're going to be filming are not pro skiers and we're going to be moving at a much different pace. And so I think it'd be good if, you know, you and I spent some time on the mountain and I tell you a little bit about skiing with girls with physical differences and some of those challenges that we're going to be encountering and how I want you to approach documenting it from a sensitive perspective. And so we spent the day, we hiked Aspen Highland Bowl and yeah, I was like very intimidated. I was like, he's a really good skier. And to me, that was like a huge turnoff because I was just like, no, he's out of my league. And then I don't know, we went to the She Lift retreat and I saw that he was very sensitive and all the girls there were like, had mad crushes on him. And I was like, yeah, actually, like, I think <laughs> I kind of have a crush on him too. And he asked me out on a date after that and asked me to lunch and we went on a date and pretty much we've been inseparable since. I mean, no joke. I moved in with him six months later and now we've been together two and a half years. So it's great. It's how it works when you know, you know. Yeah. And so my advice, or I guess you asked how, you know, advice I'd give on falling in love is I had been searching for love for so long. Like, I mean, I, you know, it's like I went on a TV show to try and find love. And what we realized is that I had to find love within myself first. Right. So that was the first step. But then secondly, it was like, once I stopped looking for it and once I was just truly invested in the things that inspired me and made me the best version of myself, then love walked in and it was like I was only fixated on she lift and skiing and hiking and being with like minded people that accepted me for who I was. I finally stopped trying to be someone that I wasn't. And then it was just like love showed up. I mean, that really is the ultimate adventure. And I know it, that that can sound kind of heady. Like if I was 32 and single right now and someone was like, just stop looking for it and it'll find you. I would be like, yeah, thanks. That's the worst advice ever. 
But I guess some more tangible advice I would say is like, just keep doing the things you love, right? If and and in that community, I think is where it shows up. So it's like if you love hiking, keep hiking. Say hi to people on the trails. Like make friends, whatever that is for you, wherever that outlet is that you can be the best version of yourself. And then that's where I think it'll it'll show up. Yeah, I met I met my love surfing. Did you? Of course. And I just kept taking his waves until he talked to me. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny how that works. And, and I would encourage, you know, I think when you're in the outdoors and you you want to experience the outdoors, it's a great place to experience love. Yeah, I agree. Any just advice for people listening who want to live more wildly, want to be more themselves no matter what? Mm-hmm. I think my biggest piece of advice is is always just to put yourself out there. Uh, take a step out of your comfort zone. It's so hard, but fortunately, you know, this is the the positive side of social media these days is that there are so many communities to join. You know, if you want to get into hiking or if you want to get into climbing or, you know, indoor cycling, like there's a group for it. And it's really scary to put yourself out there, but I can guarantee that when you do and when you make a step towards the community that you want to be a part of, magical things can happen. So I just encourage everyone to, to take that step outside of their comfort zone. Loving yourself is hard. Loving yourself when you have a physical, mental, or even emotional difference, it can sometimes feel even harder. I admire Sarah's journey to finding self-love and her unwavering ability to share her most raw, real self with us all. I also love how Sarah prioritizes self-love, adventure, and being outside in nature. I've personally been opening up more on social media about my insecurities, about how I can be really hard on myself sometimes, and hearing from people like Sarah, it reminds me I have to be better to myself. We all do. Give yourself some love right now. And remember, a little outdoor adventure is often the antidote to our own obstacles. Thank you to Sarah Heron for being so open in our conversation and for doing the work you're doing. It's really important. And I'm really grateful to you. You can follow Sarah at sarahheron.com. That's S-A-R-A-H-H-E-R-R-O-N.com and at Sarah Heron across social media. To find out more about SheLift, the organization, visit SheLift.org or on Instagram at SheLiftGrams. You can also check out her first short film, Dead Last, at REI.com. And lastly, if you want to learn more about Sarah's upcoming trip with REI, the Peru multi-sport trip from Machu Picchu to Rainbow Mountain, you can call 800-622-2236, and we'll have links to all of this in the show notes of this episode. This podcast is produced by REI with help from Annie Fassler and Chelsea Davis. Tune in week after next as I talk to a previous guest about a recent climb up Mount Everest. Yes, really, Mount Everest. As always, we appreciate when you subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you listen. Give me your feedback, tell me what you like, and go ahead and write a funny name because I'm really appreciative of a little humor. Remember, wherever you are in the world, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. (laughs) 